Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe. This is the Expat Money Show. And today's guest is the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of Ostrich, an app-based community focused on enabling people to achieve their financial goals, regardless of their level of wealth or knowledge. In order to do this, they emphasize habit building and the behavioral psychology underlying it. They provide the structure for users to work towards their goals with their financial challenges within their mobile app and add social accountability to to this by allowing users to connect with one another and see challenge progress. Please welcome to the show, Andrew Holiday. Andrew, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Mikhail. It's great to be here. Very good to have you. Why don't you take a minute and kind of walk us through your backstory? How did you end up building a mobile app in a community? How did you decide that you wanted to be a digital nomad and travel? I mean, I want to hear it all. Let's get into it. Yeah, absolutely. So just, to, I mean, to kind of set the scene for a quick bit of background, I was actually born in uh, Livingston, New Jersey, which, you know, people tend not to get from my accent. Um, and uh, my parents were expats. So they moved back to England when I was two and I grew up there, did all of my schooling there and then moved back to the US uh, when I was 18 to go to college. I played soccer at Rollins uh, down in Winter Park, Florida, which I loved and then did an MBA at the University of Rochester in uh, upstate New York, which was just literally the polar opposite of Orlando, Florida, just a very different experience. But, you know, good to good to be focused on work at that point, I think. Um, and then moved to New York City uh, after I did my MBA and started working in finance. I worked at a small family office for a couple of years doing private equity and then moved to an investment bank and did portfolio evaluation there and learned a ton. But you know, as I think is well documented, the hours and the lifestyle that come with uh, that, that industry are less than desirable. And so I got to a point where I had the opportunity um, to travel for an extended period of time. My fiance was very, very keen to, to travel full time and had been for a number of years. And so she kind of pushed me to, to make that decision and step away from what I was doing. And yeah, we chose to, to go to South America. We planned to spend six or seven months there. We kind of left it a bit open-ended and we thought, you know, we love New York, but we don't know if we're going to come back. So got rid of our staff, moved out of our apartment and uh, bought one-way tickets and uh, we had a fantastic time traveling through uh, Argentina and Chile, and we were about to hit uh, Bolivia when COVID happened in the middle of March in 2020. So we, we'd had 104 days traveling, and then we flew to my parents' house in England to, to quarantine there and literally had 104 days just by chance at my parents' house as well, which was uh, an unexpectedly pleasant experience um, as an adult moving back home for that, that period of time. Uh, and kind of during this time, uh, my co-founder and I have been talking about, you know, an idea uh, of what we could do to fix personal finance, if you will. Um, we knew there's an issue with, with massive issue with financial literacy, not just in the US, but worldwide. And uh, we've been talking about this for, for a while and kind of eventually worked our way around to the idea that, OK, if we build a community that's focused on behavioral uh, aspects of, of decision making, as opposed to presenting you with sort of an aggregation of data, which a lot of fintech apps do um then we think that that's you know that's something that can be a lot more powerful and help people actually achieve their goals and so you know when covid happened i kind of had the opportunity to take a step back and think okay this you know is kind of a good opportunity for us to be focused on this uh i can devote a lot of time to it and and so can will glass my co-founder and and we uh yeah we went for it um and you know did some testing with facebook groups early on figured out that you know being able to have that social aspect is key tried a web version, didn't work at all, didn't, weren't able to notify people and, and kind of have that accountability. And so that's, that's what led us to, to the app-based community that we're, that we're at today. Um, and we built an initial version with, uh, with no code tools that's, that's out there at the moment. And then we have a, a natively built version that a proper engineer and designer have, have helped us with uh, coming out in the next six to eight weeks or so, hopefully at the end of September. Um, so, that's kind of that's where I'm at at the moment, uh, and yeah, it's been it's been quite the journey. But I've, I'm happy with where I am right now versus you know where I was three years ago in in the finance world. I'm glad that I made the decisions I did. Brilliant. Okay, so let's get into maybe the app and the things 
that you teach in the app and the community a little bit later, sure. but let's slow it down and talk a little bit, I guess, about the decision to leave a job because you had what a lot of people would consider like a really successful career. You probably, I would imagine, making quite good money. What was that transition like? Like, what was your family like? What was the reaction, friends, when you decided to tell them that you wanted to quit, to leave it behind, sell your stuff, and go south? Sure. I think people were excited for me and for Grace, who's my fiance. Um, they were excited that we were doing it. There was certainly a little bit of incredulity. You know, there's like it's a kind of an unexpected thing, or it's something that, you know, you talk about but you never do um and as as i said grace grace had been very keen to do it she was definitely kind of the driving force behind let's let's make this a full-time thing i think from my standpoint um you know i'd been doing this finance life for a, for a few years and i learned a ton i learned so much that's you know enabled me to take on the projects that i'm taking on today but you know, my dad was in banking as well and, and worked long hours and, you know, sacrificed a lot to provide my family and myself with a really nice life. And I had a wonderful upbringing, um, very comfortable. And, you know, I decided, given the opportunity to, to kind of escape from finance, that I wanted something beyond just all of that, you know, the money, the money was good, um, you know, and it does provide a comfortable lifestyle. But, you miss out on so much in terms of things that your friends and family are doing. Like you're so tied to the office that you've got to be available at all times, certainly within the first, you know, 10, maybe even 15 years of your career before you hit those senior positions. And so it, it felt like an opportunity to say, okay, well, why don't, why don't we try doing something different? Why don't we take a break for a while? You can always come back right? Those jobs are always going to be there. If I needed to go back to finance, I would hope that somebody would hire me. Uh, but, you know, it's it's easy to be on that hamster wheel for, for 10 or 15 years and you realize that all of your 20s and half your 30s or all your 30s are gone, you know, and you look back and you think, well, it's a shame that I missed out on the first five or 10 years of my first child's life and, the, you know, first six, seven of my second child. And, and all of the holidays that you had to be working on and, and so on and so forth. And I thought, you know, I'd rather not do that if I can help it. And I want to give myself the opportunity. And so, you know, I think generally people were excited for us is, is kind of the overarching uh, sentiment that we got from friends and family um, and very, very supportive. And we had, you know, four friends come down and visit us while we were in Argentina and Mendoza. And, you know, we stayed in touch with people. We did like a little Instagram account that was for friends. And we thought, well, maybe this will take off and we'll have millions of followers by the middle of 2020. And we, we didn't, but, you know, we were able to stay in touch with people and, and ultimately that, you know, kind of drove our decision to, to come back to New York, I would say, but yeah, it was, it was an exciting thing to do, even though it was, you know, stepping away from the norm and, and giving up a lot. Well, I think that a lot of people have this in their mind that they think, you know, if I quit my job, if I get rid of my stuff, then that's it. Like it's permanent. There's no going back. Well, in actual fact, I mean, if you want to turn around, you can probably go back to your old boss and ask them. They'll probably give you your job back or you, you might even get a better job um, working at a competitor's company or something like this. I mean, the opportunities there are very great. And the downside risk in most cases, in my opinion, is like not very big. I mean, it's kind of this asymmetrical risk reward type of thing. You have an opportunity to make a massive change in your life and grow as a human being and develop and have fun and do all these incredible things. And you might not do it because you're worried about like, your car or your apartment or a job. I mean, it's, it's just a little bit silly sometimes. I think, uh, how people, um, value these types of things for me, experiences and, and travel is the most value. Like I get more out of this than I do out of anything else in the world. And that's why I continue to do that. I guess the only, uh, challenge to that is my family. Now I'm very fortunate. I travel with my family. So I actually combine the two, which is massively rewarding, but you know, I've had 
lots of jobs in my life. I've never had a job that was as fulfilling as traveling around the world. Yeah, absolutely. So Grace actually, uh, she gave her company lots of notice when she when she quit and came back with a promotion to the same company. Wow. So that just you know goes to show that if you know if you're thoughtful about it and you do the planning and think it through, you certainly have the opportunities. Um, and I think you're spot on in terms of like, you know, being worried about all of this stuff, like the seven months that we took to, to go traveling, if we'd have come right back and done, you know, gone back to the same jobs, what would we have lost in that seven months? You know, you give up the income, but of, to your point, you gain so much from having those different cultural experiences and seeing different parts of the world. And like, we, you know, we're never going to forget what ultimately turned out to be three and a half months traveling, but also three and a half months living in my parents' house. Whereas, you know, we would we remember that seven months if we'd have just been doing the same jobs and just kind of grinding away? I don't think it would have been seen as particularly special. So I think, you know, we gained a lot from that, certainly. I'm, so I'm interested. I know you've, you've been traveling, uh, you know, for an extended period for a lot longer than me. It's fantastic that you're able to go with your family. When you think about, building relationships and friendships how how do you, how have you gone about that in the past not to interview you but like how have you gone about that and and maintain it's, those as you move around all right it's interesting i've gone through many phases in my life had different interests and hobbies and different groups and i usually have sets of friends that go with each one of these so i have sets of friends that I will have in a certain country. And then if I get into a sport or a hobby, I'll have certain friends that will be around that. Usually in all of those groups, there might be one person who I continue to stay in touch with. And, you know, I've had friends that I've literally been friends with them for 20 years. I have one girl when I lived out in Western Canada, we worked together. And then when I moved to Australia, she moved there, I think just after me. And we were both in Melbourne. So we were friends for three years there. And then I had another, and then she moved to Singapore. And then I moved to Singapore by chance a couple of years after that. And we were friends there again. So, I mean, you do, it is possible to run into the same type of people. So you can have those continual long-term friendships. Um, I mean, I'm not going to be one of these cliche people and says, oh, well, thank goodness we have Facebook so we can stay in touch with one another. For me, this is a terrible way to stay in touch. I'd I don't like this type of thing. I don't want to have to spend all day long scrolling things and then, you know, just getting updates about what my friends yeah. are up to. I mean, I'm using email. I'm an email junkie and I'm constantly sending emails back and forth. I use a CRM system just for my personal relationships, just to yeah. stay in touch with people so that the, the important people to my business, the important people to my life, um, I get reminded of those types of things. Oh, it's been a couple of months. I haven't talked to this person. You know, they have an Great. anniversary. They have a birthday. They have something like this. And then, you know, I'm constantly trying to work on those things. But that has also helped me be successful in my business because my business is all about relationships. That's literally like the backbone of my business. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been at this 21 years straight. So, you know, strategies that I use today you know, didn't exist back then. And I've had to modify and go things. At this point in my life, I'm pretty okay with saying goodbye to people. That's just mm -hmm. a normal part. I don't get uh, like a pang of sadness in my heart when I have to say sure. goodbye, because it's just like, I'll see him again. And if I don't, well, then that's okay, because they were in my life for a certain amount of time. And that was a special amount of time. And that we'll always have that time. And then I try to learn from people at all opportunities. And then I hope that I have a positive influence on other people's lives. And that's what mm -hmm. I'm always trying to do is inspire people and help people and lead by example. Like I'm a really upbeat, happy, passionate guy. And I think that a lot of people appreciate that about my work, opposed to a lot of the other people who are in my space who are really like doom and gloom and really sure. negative. I think that this is, you know, you do you, that's great. But for me, I'm like mm -hmm. super upbeat and I've always got a smile on my face and I'm always trying to help people. So that's kind of my long answer to how do I keep relationships sure. going as an expat. Now, for you, did you make good friendships when you were traveling through Argentina and these countries in South America? And have you been able to keep in touch with any of those people if you did? 
So we didn't make a point, I don't think, of trying to meet other people that were traveling. And we, the way that we set our trip up was it ended up being more of like an extended vacation than than a typical, what I would think of as a typical long-term traveling strategy that I imagine you would do more of where, you know, we, we so we set up our trip, we flew to Buenos Aires, spent 30 days there settling in and like figuring out, okay, you know, let's, let's just sort of give ourselves a bit of time to get used to this. And then from there, we started to jump around much more often. We had, you know, three or four days here, a week here and there, and, and continued to try and see as much as we could, because we were trying to, you know, ultimately we were trying to do a lot in the six or seven months as it turned out. But that, you know, that 30 days, we could have tried, you know, been more intentional about trying to find people to, to build relationships with, but I don't think we did that. And I think, you know, if we were doing it again, maybe we would make more of an effort to meet people who were also traveling or who were local. Um, you know, but we were, we were very much focused on let's see all of the things and let's, you know, have a wonderful time and we're here with each other. And this is, you know, we're not working. Let's just enjoy our company, um, you know, and, and see how we go. And I think, you know, it was, it was great. We had a, a wonderful time. But I would say, I mean, the people that we spent the most time talking to or getting to know were Airbnb hosts. Um, you know, when we when we stayed with people who are hosting, as opposed to, um, you know, just renting from somebody who doesn't live in the in the place that you're staying. Uh, and that certainly, if you're, you know, time limited in a place, certainly not in Buenos Aires, we had our own our own spot. But when you've got a few days or a week here and there we found that it was incredibly helpful to stay with somebody who could point you in the right direction and, and tell you where to go. And often these people are really nice and they're, you know, happy to share and you get to experience a bit of local culture that you otherwise wouldn't. So they were kind of, you know, the, the relationships that I guess we would probably have made more of a point to, to stay in touch with if perhaps if, you know, they were English speaking and we were able to build more of a relationship in a short period of time then I think we might have stayed in touch. But, you know, between my Spanish is okay. Grace doesn't speak much Spanish. So we didn't, we weren't able to build deep relationships in, in those periods of time. So I have some insight for you. And maybe this is insight slash advice. My yeah. experience and what I have seen in my travels is in the first couple of months, you are, like, say you're doing an extended trip. You are still yourself for that first couple of months. And mm -hmm. it's usually around month three, month four, month five, that you really start to fall into a new groove. And it's like, you start to accept that this is your life. You are traveling and you have all the time in the world. I guess a, a follow-up question for you is, did you find yourself in the first couple of months being like really busy because you were really busy in your job and you felt like you needed to like get the most out of this. You needed to do the most and, and you didn't want to waste any days. I, I'd so I think that we, we did try and do a lot. We tried to see a lot of things. We tried to make sure we were maximizing our time. We did go into it um, with the intention of having some days where we were just kind of relaxed and didn't set a plan and didn't have to do anything. And we could just kind of, you know, if we wanted to go for a walk around Palermo, Hollywood, where we were staying in Buenos Aires, and we could do that and just kind of explore the neighborhood and, and chill out and take a bit of time to think about, you know, what do we want to do with this time that we now have to ourselves? Um, and, and we tried to be intentional about that, but certainly, you know, we also tried to make a point of making sure that we didn't miss any of the major things that we wanted to see. And then once we got out of Buenos Aires and, you know, we went to Iguazu Falls for a couple of days and then down to Patagonia, to Ushuaia, we it definitely, we started kind of, you know, rocking and rolling then at that point. It was most of the time we were doing things and we would have travel days. And, you know, if we hit somewhere for a week, we might take a day off from like high activities, but we were definitely on a reasonably uh, full schedule I would say, as we, as we sort of got into month two and month three. Well, that's definitely what I've seen. Cause I remember some of my larger trips and I was like, go, 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 go for the first mm -hmm. couple of months. And then it was like, 
it's okay. Like I can take a day and sleep till noon or grab my book and just go to the park and just read my book all day. And at first I was like, no, that's a waste of time. I could read anywhere. I could sleep anywhere. I need, you know, I'm in this country. I need to go out there and be seeing people and, or meeting people and seeing things and trying all the different food and doing all this stuff. And then the longer I traveled, it was like the more time I took just to myself. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people probably don't know this, but I'm actually very introverted. I mean, okay. Yes. After 150 podcast episodes and being interviewed probably 200 times, I've taught myself how to be really outgoing, but my natural state is just to kind of be a homebody and just really slow, relax. I need a lot of time to myself. So for me, I saw this and I've seen it in other people as well, that they try to pack so much in. And then eventually it's like they kind of relax and let things happen a little bit more naturally. So it's kind of curious because you're at that, probably that cusp at three and a half, four months where you'd really see that transformation. And I hope that you have an opportunity to do like another really big extended trip and see if what I'm saying is true for you or it's yeah. not, and it, and it might not be, but that's just my experience on that. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, gutting to hear that we were right around the time that it would have got really good, <laughs> but we also, I mean, I wouldn't, I, I am not upset with the experience we had, but I certainly, I think now thinking about it, I would arrange certain things differently and try to spend more time. I think we were going to, tried to do three or four weeks in Lima when we got there and, and kind of give ourselves another period to just relax. And I think that probably would have been the time where it really came, you know, to fruition that we thought, okay, this is, this is how we want to set up this trip where we can have a couple of weeks of, of kind of doing a lot of stuff and seeing, you know, touristy things. And then a few weeks where we just find somewhere that we like, that we want to be, and we just exist and figure out what does that look like ideally for us? And I think we didn't, quite get to the point where we figured out what does that ideally look like but certainly i mean i yeah something that we would like to we would like to go back and finish the trip for sure i mean so did like you say that you had stuff. bought a one-way ticket remind me yeah yeah that's we, the way to we, do it for sure absolutely and we had a weird we we're in a weird situation where it was cheaper to fly from new york to london to buenos aires than it was to fly New York straight to Buenos Aires. And so we we did like a weird, we had a, a week over Thanksgiving at my parents' house with uh, a bunch of our friends from New York who came over to stay with us. And then uh, we flew from there to Buenos Aires when everybody flew back. Um, one way um, we knew, you know, we had a plan. We knew roughly how much time we had and we had a budget and we, we just left it open-ended and we weren't sure where we were going to go when the end came and ultimately it was it was nice to have that you know when when everything went tits up we were just in a position where we said okay well we're gonna miss out on these bus tickets that we've booked for next week <laughs> but we don't really have anything else that we have to worry about we can just jump on a plane and and get out of here um so and when that was a you nice left on your trip was it um you had savings, you saved up money and you were going to go and travel or had you started your business at that point? So we had savings and we were going to go and travel. Will and I had been, we'd been talking about this and we're sort of working towards it. Um, you know, before that, I think for a, for a number of months before that, um, and I was kind of taking this time, I was going to go and travel and, and, you know, figure out how am I going to work on this while I'm away there's nothing that we can't do remote. Um, so, you know, we're going to, we're going to see how we go. Um, and it was, yeah, so it was, it was an interesting experience. We certainly, I th again, if I was planning this now, I would set it up differently where it was more, you know, if I'm going to focus on work, then I'm going to put myself in the same spot for, you know, uh, 30 days at a time or more and then I'm going to fan out on on weekends or every few days to go see different different parts of of the country that I'm in um, and have that home base where I can be more focused on work um, certainly I didn't I didn't feel like with the style of traveling that we were doing I didn't feel like I got an awful lot done <laughs> while we were away um, so I was able to think about a lot of things but I you know I certainly wouldn't say that we made as much as much progress as we could have um, while I was on the road.
Which I think is completely fine because I mean, I've had large portions of my life where I'm so focused on one thing and I work so many hours that actually when I take a break, it's, it's really healthy. Like I get these amazing creative thoughts. Um, I allow my brain to relax a little bit, which actually benefits my business. So if you had gone from working crazy hours in New York to traveling and you went to straight away to build your own app and everything like that, um, you probably wouldn't have as much insight. So probably that interim period of a couple of months, just allowing yourself to do something completely different and not be addicted to your screen every minute of every day, you probably had a lot of insights on the business that allowed it to be what it is now. Um, first of all, would you say that that is a true statement or did you see something different there? No, I would agree because I think a lot of the reason, you know, that I, I kind of alluded to for for quitting the job and, and going traveling was because of that lifestyle. And I think something that I, you know, spent a good amount of time in, in therapy working on before we left was figuring out how to be productive. Like I knew I was going to have this venture and that I wanted to maximize time outside of work. Um but I didn't feel like I was getting a lot done in my downtime when I had it and came to the point where I thought, okay, you know, I've been through a lot of therapy and, and come to a realization that really, I just don't have the mental capacity uh, to go with, you know, doing a full-time job and thinking about ostrich and thinking creatively and coming up with good ideas. Um, and a big part of the reason for leaving was to, to free that up and enable myself to think creatively. And I think, you're, you're absolutely right that, yeah, it, it certainly enabled me to, to have better periods of thinking when I was focusing on, on Ostrich while we were away and, and coming up with creative ideas for how to solve issues that I certainly don't think, you know, we would have, we would have come up with some of the ideas that we did if, if I'd have just been working full time still. I understand that because like, okay, so from my experience, the last few years, I had partnered with a, a group of guys and we were running a very large website in the offshore space. And I was working, I want to say about 13, 14 hours a day, six and a half days a week for a couple of years straight. And it was like work, 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 nonstop around the clock. I was rebuilding a business. And I thought I was doing fine. Like, honestly, like I, I still slept good amount at night, but I mean, I would eat my lunch and I, I work from home. So I'd eat my lunch. It would take me 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And then I'd go back upstairs and I'd be on the computer. And then I'd come downstairs mm -hmm. for 20 minutes for dinner. And then I'd go back upstairs and I'd work for another three, four hours. And I was working till 10 o'clock at night, every single night. I ended up leaving that company and, and terminating my agreement with my business partners. And I took three weeks in Costa Rica with my family and I didn't do anything for three weeks. I mean, like I did activities. I mean, we went mm -hmm. quadding and surfing and we yeah. went swimming every day and we we're at the beach. And all of a sudden, like all my creativity came back to me and all these different ideas and businesses I wanted mm -hmm. to start ways that I could help people and inspire people. And it's like, I didn't even realize that my creativity had kind of been stifled over the last couple of years. And I don't think it was like at the day one, it just disappeared. I mean, it was like a gradual process that it just kind of got mm -hmm. e eaten away because I was overworked. So it took three weeks for that. And then we started traveling again and now we're in Brazil and it's like, my brain just works so completely different yeah. than it did before. <laughs> and now I have all these amazing ideas and things that I want to do. And I'm like, you know, if I was working 14 hours, 13 hours a day right now, I know that yeah. I wouldn't have a chance to do that. So now I'm trying to work a lot less and mm -hmm. do a lot more of like nothing time, just hang out with my family, go for walks on the beach. And yeah. it actually benefits my business by working less. It's, it's kind of the opposite of this hustle, hustle, grind, grind mentality, mm -hmm. as you've probably seen as an entrepreneur. And I've, I've certainly seen, or, or things that are promoted by, I don't know, Gary V and guys like this, you know, yeah. 24 seven. So I don't know. But, Sell your soul to your business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's just kind of uh, an off on a little tangent, but 
I guess my the moral of the story is allow yourself to do nothing and to have time for creative thought because it will probably do you well in the end. I think so. And it's certainly, I mean, that's something that, you know, I was interested in going into traveling and have continued to be interested in now with, you know, a more flexible schedule that I'm able to set is what, what is that optimum balance where, you know, I'm, I've obviously I have a ton to do, right. We're setting up a business and there's, there's so many things to take care of. And you just, you could work 24 seven if you wanted to, and still never get anything done as you well know. But as you also well know, it's just, it's fruitless to do that. There's no point. And so striking that right balance between getting what you need to get done, done, but also giving yourself that downtime to maximize your ability to work when you are working, I think is really key. And I think it's, it's tricky because I feel like it's different for every single person. There's no right answer. It's like a, you and you may or may not agree, but I, I feel like it's a you need to experiment and figure out what does that look like for you in order to maximize your abilities to succeed in what it is that you want to do. So I think it's amazing that you've been able to do that. You recognize that, you know, working as much as you were wasn't wasn't doing it for you and you've struck that right balance at the moment and that it maximizes your ability to succeed and enjoy life. It's fantastic. Yeah. And I think that in the future, I will do these massive sprints again, where I work mm-hmm. crazy hours. You know, if I have a really big project or something like that, or I'm really yeah. trying to launch something new, but at the same time, taking time off has so many benefits to it, which I didn't realize. Like I said, I am a workaholic. Everybody, mm-hmm. you know, knows this. My family knows this. Um, I am a very focused person. So this is something that I've struggled with, but I'm coming to the realization that it actually is beneficial to take time off. So let's jump a little bit into your project. I want to talk about ostrich. I want to talk about, first of all, I guess, how the idea came about. And then maybe afterwards we can get into, you know, how it works and what you're helping people with. Yeah, sure. So as I said, Will Will Glass, my co-founder, he's the CEO, he came up with the idea he and i met at rollins we played soccer together there and we stayed in touch over the years and saw each other periodically um you know been i visited him in thailand while he was on a fulbright scholarship there and he's he's come to england stayed at my family's house without me so but we've been close friends for a long time and uh over the years as we'd stayed in touch he'd always talked about personal finance as something that he was very interested in and focused on um, and that's because he uh, saw firsthand the problems that it can cause, right? So his parents ended up splitting up uh, because of communications issues around finances during the, the credit crunch, right, in 2008. Um, and so that was kind of the driving force for him to want to get into this space. And so we had talked about different ideas around how to address financial literacy issues and and communication issues around personal finance for for a while and he moved up to new york city in i think 2017 and so we at that point we sort of started kicking around these ideas a bit more seriously and thinking about okay well what should we do in order to in order to fix this um you know and i started thinking about okay well, what am i doing with my personal finances and realized that i was you know put money into an IRA, but not really saving anything beyond that, which in New York City is easier to do than I would care to admit. Unfortunately, it's very easy to spend pretty much everything you make, um, mostly on rent and eating out, which is, uh, you know, sad to admit, but it's very easy to do. And so, you know, I started to look more seriously into that and address it for myself. And and at that point in time, we, we came to the conclusion that we thought, okay, there's tons of really good apps out there like mint and personal capital and status money that that offer you data aggregation this is you know here's everything you need to know about your financial life but it's not fixing anything you know people are still having massive problems with financial literacy and with achieving their financial goals and so we thought okay well let's take a step back and think about what is it that enables you to achieve goals and it's all about habit building and accountability and so we looked at what had been done really well in the fitness industry, the company like Strava, you know, that's taken these challenges and enabled people to compete together with each other and everybody succeeds, 
you know, if you work hard, I'm really happy for you and it drives me to work hard. And then I also, you know, get fitter. And we thought, well, maybe we can apply this to, to the finance industry. And so we, we started to, to build out this idea of let's have a community where we're able to bring in social accountability to financial goal setting and achievement and have everybody work together to, to drive success for society. And, you know, thought this is something that if, if it scales and we're right, then, you know, we can do something that's really positive for society as a whole. I think that's something that's really exciting to, to both of us. Um, and, you know, and then, as I mentioned before, you know, we started with a Facebook group with about 40 people and it was, it was great. We had, you know, 80% of people hitting their goals versus I think 8% of people usually hit goals that they set for themselves. Um, you know, and, and of those 40 people, I think, uh, on in aggregate, they saved over ten thousand dollars in uh, in a challenge that was around just not spending money on something they didn't want to spend on. So it was a frugal fall is the name of it. And they just picked a category like online shopping or you know buying coffee every day. Like I don't want to do this. And you come back to the Facebook group and you check in every day and you say I did do it or I didn't do it. And it drives that motivation. And so we saw a lot of success. And then you know tried the web version, didn't work, and moved on to the app because we think that that blends the best of you know providing that community as well as us being able to notify you and and be in your pocket so that we keep you accountable um and and that's where we're at now so we're building out building out this app but that's kind of the the genesis of the of the idea and how we ended up coming to this solution that we're at today well i think it's important and this is the main thing of what i just heard celebrating your successes in finance because in today's society there are so many people, the rich are all vilified, business owners, entrepreneurs are being vilified at every turn. People who are successful and driving the economy, they're seen as the monsters, that they need to pay more tax and give more of their fair share and support more other people so that they can stay home. And actually, it's entrepreneurship that is the driving force in society, in my opinion. People who build businesses, who build opportunities. And you should be financially free. I want every single one of my listeners to be financially free. I am constantly trying to inspire people and have amazing people like you on my show who can help them do these types of things. So by building a community where you actually celebrate these types of successes, that is powerful. Like that is super, super powerful because from all other sides, it's this negative you know, and it's, it has become completely acceptable for people to max out their credit card, have hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loan, take a mortgage that they can't afford and live beyond their means. And even simple things like not getting your Starbucks coffee and then putting that money aside every month, those are small wins. But I would imagine, and, and I'm curious if your insights, that those types of things would probably snowball into larger things. And by starting the conversation around finance and making it acceptable to talk about money again, this is huge. Like this is a really important thing that needs to be discussed. I think, yeah, I think you're spot on. It's, it's definitely starting small. And I think that, you know, so we're, we're currently in uh, an AARP innovation labs accelerator that, we, you know, we're going through at the moment. And so we've been really lucky to be able to do a bunch of research with them in association with them. And one of the things that's come out is that, you know, the, the key feelings that people have when they think about money are anxiety and uh, being overwhelmed. And for a lot of people, it's shame, you know, and, and you, that I think that's amplified as you make the uh, as you bring the demographic younger. Right. If you skew towards like 18 to 35 years old those feelings are, are more powerful and that's, that's the overriding feeling that people have. And so bringing it to, you know, making it more accessible again, making personal financial goals feel appropriate and achievable and something that you can talk about is just so important because you think about how many mistakes people make uh, when it comes to money and we don't want to talk about those mistakes, but that's how you learn. You know, if you if you think about like, it, say you don't want to talk about money with your family, you know, because and for a lot of people, uh, that's, that brings up a lot of feelings. It's really difficult to talk about money with their family. But if your parents made a bunch of financial mistakes, then how are you going to learn from them if you can't talk about it with them? And so, you know, what we're trying to do is you can't always talk to your family 
about money you kind of we talk to your friends about money but what we're trying to do is within this community bring together people who are either in similar situations or you know maybe people have been successful having been in your situation and made it out and connect those people so that you're able to learn from each other's financial mistakes and it's another part of you know making the conversation easier and changing the feelings around the around personal finance so that it like you said you can start off with the small wins make make little gains to begin with and just make it feel like you're achieving something and then you start to put that money to work towards larger goals that you have whether that's paying down debt or saving for retirement or investing or you know you want to get married you want to start a family there's so many things that you know will cost you a lot of money but you've got to start somewhere and making that somewhere feel accessible and easy is is really key i i think anyway i'm i'm curious as to how your uh journey to to where you are today with finances happened like what were your steps that you took to be really interested and you know what do you do now to to hold yourself accountable to goals and to be successful like you are I have a pretty eclectic background. I mean, I started, okay, uh, all my listeners know. So I dropped out of school when I was 12 years old. I, um, I started traveling internationally when I was about 16 or 17. And I was just working for a living, whatever odd job I could get for the first few years. Yep. And then probably about 10 years in, I got interested in personal finance. And then I got interested in stock market and then specifically options trading. So I traded derivatives for seven years and made a lot of money in that. Um, from there, I went into doing entrepreneurship and building businesses and tried and failed, or I don't know, half a dozen times, maybe a dozen times. Ooh. I mean, everything from trying to start a gym to an online t-shirt company to supplements to, I don't know, all kinds of random different things. Yeah. And then we started this podcast about five years ago. I was already um, studying marketing and I was already running my own email newsletter for a few years before that, but started this mm -hmm. podcast about five years ago. And I've just been doing investments on the side. And my investments are considerably different than most people's because I've traveled for mm -hmm. so long. I'm always investing in countries that most people are not looking at in foreign real estate or bonds or foreign companies, precious metals. I was in Bitcoin in 2017 you know, when it was $900 and then saw it go all the way up to $20,000 and then all the way back down Love again. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm, I mean, it's no secret. I'm independently wealthy right now. I can do whatever I want. I mean, right. you know, at 38 years old, I could literally retire tomorrow if I wanted to, but you know, mm -hmm. I have so much fun doing this type of podcast and this type of work Absolutely. and helping people that it's like, I don't think I'll ever retire. You know, I, right. I love this type of work and I love finding new and interesting investments and bringing other people in and helping other people to become financially free. Um, you know, for me, this works very well as a very, you know, hardcore libertarian. I'm very anti big state, anti big medical, sure. anti big education, anti basically all the other things. All the things that other people think are normal are usually the things that I stand mm -hmm. against. But instead of spending yeah. all day complaining about these things, I'm trying to actually put forth real life strategies. And being an expat and living overseas and traveling, I think is one of the best solutions that you can actually have to have more freedom. So mm -hmm. with the podcast, having financial freedom, living overseas and legally reducing your tax bill, um, you know, living your life with passion and adventure in and exploring the world and seeing how big this place is that we, this planet mm -hmm. is, those are the types of things. And it's not always easy. And I certainly have made many mistakes. And if my listeners have been listening to this show for a long time, you've probably heard a lot about my mistakes. Mm -hmm. I'm very open about these things. I am not perfect by any means, but the point is that I keep trying and I keep showing mm -hmm. up every single day and keep trying to make things better. So I guess in a certain way, I have built my own community about these with these types of things. And I think that a lot yeah. of my listeners follow along with my journey. What you've been able mm -hmm. to do is actually help make the connections between the the people like one to one without having to just go through someone like me where it's just forward facing like we run a facebook mm -hmm. group it's at expatmoneyforum.com you know i think we have 2300 2400 2400 people something like that at this point 
And it's so cool to see that connection between the people and the friendships that are made. Um, so it's not all about me. Like, I don't want this to be about me. Actually, I don't want it to be about me at all. I want people to open up dialogue with one another. And that's why I wanted you to be on because, well, first of all, to hear about your experience as an expat and traveling, which is, you know, just fun to talk about. I love talking travel Absolutely. still today. <laughs> travel is the greatest thing ever, but no also doubt. about this community that you're creating. So what are some of the other pitfalls that you've seen that people are falling into in p- personal finance and how are they overcoming these types of things? Sure. So I think, you know, a lot, a lot of the problems, especially in the research that we've done, that we've, that we've come across, people perceive that, you know, they need to save more money and they just don't know how to get started. So that's the, like the, that's the key initial stumbling block is just that feeling of like, oh, I'm overwhelmed. I don't have the money. I need to get started somewhere, but I don't want to think about it. And so they continue on autopilot. And so I was the first thing that you should do, I think, when you're thinking about, okay, I, I feel like I want to change my habits is set, you know, be intentional about it and write something down. That's the first thing you can do is like, if you have, if you have a goal in any aspect of your life, writing it down is so powerful in terms of just making you feel accountable to yourself and, and wanting to make change. Um, you know, another key thing that we see is people saving for retirement and then not investing those funds. So putting money away into like an, an IRA or, you know, if you're in the UK, it's like an ISA, you can have, there's similar kind of tax efficient accounts all around the world, but putting that, putting that money into it and then not investing it and just letting it sit there. And so, you know, you miss out on so much upside when, when you do that, you know, just having, having your money invested in basic Vanguard ETFs or, you know, total stock market funds is going to provide you with, you know, 10, 15, 20 times and more, depending on how long you have until retirement, uh, the, the money that you need to, to be able to retire on. And so it's all about a combination of one, setting goals and being intentional about it. And then two, having the information that you need to be able to succeed in those goals. And so what we're trying to do is make those goals accessible you know, with kind of either with basic education or through our challenges that are preset and that kind of give you a bit of structure to be able to say, okay, yes, I want to save more money or I want to pay down debt or I want to invest. And then in conjunction with that, providing these educational resources that say, hey, here's some basics. And, you know, what we're trying to do is say for 80% of the people, you know, a limited strategy is going to work. These are the best practices. And if you want more information because you're in a unique situation, such as for you, you know, if you're trying to, if your goal is I want to invest in every single country that I go and live in and I want to do interesting asset classes, then our aim is to build a repository of resources where we can act as kind of a conductor and just point you in the right direction if you've got very specific or esoteric interests or needs or wants. And whether that's, you know, to different websites and resources on the internet or to people on the platform that we know are experts in certain areas, such as, you know, if you were on the platform and somebody else wanted to invest, we'd say, Hey, you should follow Macau. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's invested in so many countries around the world. He's all about tax efficiency. Um, this is the guy that you should follow and check out his resources. And maybe he's going to, you know, be putting out things where he's willing to do AMAs and things like that, you know? And so it's, it's trying to connect people with the right, either people or resources who are going to guide them in the direction that, that they need to go in and, and sort of push them towards their goals. And then you have that accountability aspect that's always there that is really the kind of the most important thing. After you've written your goal down, having an accountability partner that you regularly check in with makes you 95% more likely to achieve a goal, which is just incredible. And so for us, what we're, you know, one of the key tenets of the app is we want to add that ability to connect and be accountable, not just with our application, but with other people through the application. And, and so how does it work goals. then? It's you help match people up with one other person. So it's a one-on-one or it's more of a so, group where there's multiple people giving feedback. So it can be either. You can, you can set up challenges such that it's either private to you, it's private to you and uh, you know one other person, two other people, three other people. So say you've got like a, a group vacation coming up 
or a bachelor party, bachelorette party, you know, and you've each, you've, you're going to split everything equally. You can set a savings goal and everyone's in this challenge. And every week you check in, you say, did I hit my goal for savings this week? I needed to save, you know, a hundred dollars this week and we've got 12 weeks to go. And everybody checks in and it's a private group. Or we have kind of broader community challenges such as Frugal Fool, um, where you can take part and you're working with everybody in the community. Uh, and everybody can see like, it's either, did you hit your goal? Did you not hit your goal? There's no numbers. You don't have to say, I'm trying to save, you know, $5,000 or I'm trying to avoid spending a hundred dollars a day on alcohol or anything like that. It's just, you say your goal, did you hit your goal? Did you not hit your goal? And you're accountable to the community and everyone can see, you know, if you choose, everyone can see whether you're hitting your goal or not. And that's that accountability piece. And then future feature that we're planning is this ability to connect you with people who are in a similar situation to you or in a situation that you would like to get to based on milestones and interests and enabling you to work with, the, with that person or as part of a group and a club that is working on similar goals. So we have kind of several different approaches to, to that accountability, depending on what works for you. Okay, amazing. Well, and eclectic, the word that you mentioned earlier is certainly how I would uh, classify <laughs> my investing strategy. It is very eclectic and very esoteric. I think that was the other word that you had used. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I often do not email about specific investments because there's so many, there's so much downside risk and there's pitfalls and regulations and things mm -hmm. like that, that I often don't feel so comfortable recommending specific investments. I'm getting past that a little bit more now. Um, and I'm opening up certain investments to, you know, a core group of people. And mostly it's just to accredited investors, just, you know, if uh, sophisticated and accredited sense. investors, you can go and look up what the regulations are for that or, or the mm -hmm. classifications. And I mean, if anybody's listening today or anyone from your audience do want to get in on that list and see some of the private deals that we're doing, just shoot me an email at, it's mikel at expatmoney.io.io. And I'll be able to add you. But once again, you're going to have to be an accredited investor. And we get some pretty out there things, some things that you might not think about. So there might be some also some opportunity where we can do some synergy, uh, Andrew, and you know That's offer right. some of these types of things to some of your people as well. Because I, I do want to help people. Um, mm -hmm. I just have to make sure that I'm protected because I mean, yeah. I don't have a crystal ball and I can't see the future. I make the best decisions with the information that is available to me at that exact moment. A lot of my stuff has always been protecting from the downside, a lot of the asset protection, because I feel very comfortable about doing these types of things. First of all, I have a lot of experience mm -hmm. in it. But second yeah. of all, if you are structuring in the right way or we're legally minimizing your taxes, I mean, there's very little that's going to go wrong by protecting yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah, no doubt. And I think that uh, as much as anything else, I, no, I, I think it's fantastic that you're that you're starting to kind of open up and, and let people into that that kind of internal deal process that you have and, and those investments that you specifically choose. Um, but in addition to that, I think as much as anything else, it's interesting for people to hear philosophies behind investing because... I think something that, you know, we've seen with, uh, with all the research that we've done and the people using the platform that we have is that ultimately you still have to want to achieve things for yourself. You know, th this isn't going to get handed to you on a plate. You've got to make changes. You have to build the habit. And what we're doing is providing the environment, you know, to maximize your ability to do that. But, you know, for people to be able to hear your philosophy and how you evaluate investments as much as anything else when you're thinking about doing it internationally or understand kind of the, the nuts and bolts logistically of being able to invest in Brazil at the same time as Australia at the same time as Panama, you know, is, is as much as we can hope to, to provide. And then those people have to make their own choices as to like, is this the right thing for me to do? Or, you know, what do I want to do with my money, putting it into Brazil, maybe I want to do something different to Mikel. Maybe, you know, if he's in real estate, I'm more interested in mining assets and, you know, thinking about that, but it's, it's that combination of providing the information and infrastructure for you to be able to figure out what should your goals be for you. And then how are you going to go about achieving them and stay accountable to those goals? 
Yeah. Well, personal responsibility is a massive thing and certainly it is applicable in personal finance. I mean, if you're listening to this and you're thinking that someone else should pay for you or, you know, you do an investment and it goes south and it's someone else's fault. Well, no, actually it's probably your fault. You didn't do enough due diligence. You didn't understand it enough. You didn't do enough research. You didn't speak to your lawyer or, you know, get outside counsel to look at these things for you, or you didn't get local counsel because you, you thought that you understood the market where clearly you don't. I mean, you need to take responsibility for yourself. I mean, that is also a huge tenement of this show, personal responsibility. So that is something that needs to be promoted. And, and I'm glad to hear that you are promoting that on your application because if people miss this part, I think it's going to be very difficult to build sustainable wealth and, and real life wealth. You know, if you're always looking for external sources, like, I mean, for me, the buck stops with me. Like that's just, that's the way it is. So anytime that you are investing or you're following me or someone else or anyone else, you know, you need to do your own research. You need to do your own due diligence. You can't just trust you know, everything that someone says, don't trust everything that I say. I mean, I'll give you opportunities and I'll make ideas and brainstorm things, but it's still your, your responsibility to go out there and make a decision for yourself. Yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely vital to make sure that you, you know, you understand why you're doing something and, and whether it fits with, you know, what you value and what you believe in. And I think that, yeah, couldn't agree more. So let's talk a moment about your personal transformation. How did, you know, personal finance affect you so that you could go travel the world so you could build your own business? What were the types of things that you learned? And then maybe we can kind of get into, you know, how this helped other people, I suppose. Yeah, sure. So I think, as I had said, you know, I, when, when Will moves to New York and we started talking about this idea more seriously, I started thinking about, you know, what am I doing with my finances and, and paid more attention, did more research. Um, and sort of learn the importance of, you know, saving and investing for retirement and building an emergency fund and the different types of accounts that are out there. And then, you know, ultimately we came to a point where Grace and I were thinking about this, you know, are we going to travel long-term? Are we going to quit our jobs? How are we going to make this work? And we, you know, we came up with a plan that was very intentional for here's the amount of money that we want to save. This is the date that we're going to do it on. And this is how we're going to go about quitting and so on and so forth. But from a finance perspective, something that was vital for us was having each other to hold ourselves accountable. You know, I had to make decisions to be able to save a certain amount of money to be able to go and do this extended period of travel. And so did she. And we were committed to doing that. And it was easy for us to say no to doing certain things and, and to not book other trips and to say no to dinners, you know, did not buying certain types of clothing, um, which, as you know, the wardrobe for traveling for long periods when you're going to be moving around a lot, very different to working in finance in New York City. Um, so, you know, making those decisions was it was so much easier when I had somebody else to do this with who I was accountable to. And I think that that really brought itself into how we thought about the app. You know, that was a very personal experience that made it very clear to me that, hey, it's a lot easier to do this when there's somebody there to keep you accountable. And so, you know, what we've seen up to this point is that it's it's so important and it's so powerful when you have this community. So even in the Facebook group, like I said, we had 80 percent of people hitting their goals when only eight percent of people usually do. And even external to just the challenge where people were choosing to cut out spending, they were making good decisions around saving for retirement and putting more money into their, you know, 401k accounts, cutting out other areas of spending and reallocating savings into, into different buckets for different goals, you know, whether it's separating it for, oh, I've got a house fund in addition to my emergency fund. And just being more conscious about all of these different areas of finance, just because of one no spending challenge where they chose to stop online shopping for a couple of months. Um, so having that, yeah, that accountability again, I mean, I keep coming back to it. Sound like a, sound like a broken record, but we think it's so important and it's, you know, not just based on what we've seen, but it's personal experience as well. Um, and that's really, that's really been a key driver for me for the past couple of years. 
And so what's been the response from the people who have been through this program? Have they, how has this affected their life? How has their life changed? Like what are the, the substantial things that have actually happened to them? So they're able to pay down significant amounts of debt. I think that's one of the biggest things that we've seen that, you know, people, whether it's through lack of education or lack of motivation, they often don't think about paying down extra student debt. You know, you have like you're kind of presented with a student debt, you have a monthly payment that you have to make and you can just forget about it. And, you know, 10 years later, you will have paid it off, but you've paid a massive chunk of interest. And so having this, you know, accountability and community to say, hey, you can and should pay down your student debt faster or other types of debt if you have them, um, you know, if the money is there to do it. And that's something that we've seen that's been really, really powerful is that people have really picked up on that and they'll go through our debt pay down challenges, whether it's, you know, snowball or avalanche, whatever tactic you want to pick. And they really work on, you know, paying down their debt that much faster. And as I said, you know, we saw in the Facebook group testing and that we've seen on the current version of the platform, people start to make better decisions around the rest of their financial life as well. You start to make progress in one area and you think, wow, this is great. I love having more money. And what am I going to do with it? And you start to look into what's the best way to save money in the savings account? What's the best way to invest it? If I'm going to put it towards retirement, if I'm going to have a brokerage account, um, you know, do I have goals around uh, donating to charity? Are there causes that I want to support? Let me look into what percentage of my income do I want to donate and how do I want to set that up on a monthly basis? Who do I want to donate to? And, you know, we've got all of those resources within the app. So it's, it's what's been really fantastic is us seeing People come in for one reason, such as paying down debt, and then taking advantage of other parts of the app because they're interested now and they feel like they're succeeding and being able to really build like an entire sort of financial life that's that's less stressed, where they're able to build good habits and, and achieve their goals. And it's really, I mean, it's incredibly satisfying to, to see it working like that. Um, you know, and I think that for us, if, if we're only doing that for a few people, that's been successful for us, right? It's fantastic that some people are getting value out of it. And hopefully the bigger it gets, the larger the network gets, the more community there is, the more powerful it is for more people. And if we can continue providing value to people like that, I think, you know, that's, that's our kind of our main aim. That's what we really want to do. Brilliant. Andrew, I love it. Super fascinating conversation. If my listeners want to find out more about what you do, if they want to download the app, if they want to get involved, where can we send them? So head to getostrich.com, G-E-T-O-S-T-R-I-C-H.com. That's our website. You'll be able to find uh, the app on there. You can download it. You'll be able to find a lot of our learning resources as well. You can click around and learn more about the company and, and what we do. Um, you can find us on, on all the social media platforms at the Ostrich app. Um, and if you're interested in my journey, it's uh, Andrew H1492 on Twitter. Um, and you'll be able to find Will through there as well if you, if you want to follow along with us. Brilliant. Andrew, I love it. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks very much, Mikhail.